All right, and we're live. All right, do we got everybody pretty much trickled in? Looks like we do. So I'm gonna call this meeting to order. And we'll start this meeting. Thank you guys for joining us, everyone virtually. We're hoping that at our next meeting, we will be able to be back in person. Um, so I'm really excited about that. And I'm hoping to, we'll, be able to have a few visitors. I don't know. I'll have to take that up with the administration to see if that's something that's possible. Um, in any event, so we're going to go ahead and get started. And we're going to start with our, um, oh, sorry, before that, we did have an executive session prior to this meeting to discuss a personnel matter. So I will um, go ahead and start with our flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag. My flag. of the United, United States, States of America, America. And, and to the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with, with liberty, liberty and, justice and, justice for all. and justice for all. All right, next on our agenda is our roll call. Terry. Okay, Mr. Reimers. I'm here. Mr. Spear. Here. Mr. Akmanowicz. He's there, but he just, he's muted. Me? I thought, I'm sorry, did you not hear me? I'm present. No. I, I gotcha. Ms. Weed, she's not here today, right? Right. Mr. Kern. Present. Mrs. Mitchell. Here. Mr. Micucci. Mr. Jackson. Us. Yeah. I am live online. And Mr. Klein. Hello. Hello. Thank you. All right. Um, just a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. Next on the agenda is the approval of the March 25th minutes, as well as the approval of April 8th minute, so I'll need a motion. Mr. Jackson, so we'll, I'll let Steve take it, I'll second it. Thank you. Okay, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously. We're going to move on to our next item, which is our first uh, opportunity for general public comment. And Mrs. Finn, uh, Layson, would you like to go ahead and read those and tell us how many we have ahead of time? We have six. All right. Um, the first one is from Kendra Weininger from Richland Township. I ask the board to take into strong consideration the change of school start times for sixth grade students to be significantly different than their seventh and eighth grade middle school peers. If this change occurs, the district would be excluding sixth grade students from being able to participate in the middle school musical, cheerleading, intramural sports, the Gay Straight Alliance, being managers for sports teams, as well as in many other joint clubs and programs that meet at Strayer. The district's commitment to the social and emotional growth of our children is facilitated by connecting sixth graders with their peers at Strayer through these activities that have shared for years. This helps the goal of the sixth grade center to quote, serve as the scaffold between the elementary and secondary school worlds, end quote. Thank you for your consideration. 
The next comment is from the QCSD kindergarten teachers. We are writing this letter to express our support towards implementing universal full day kindergarten across the district. As kindergarten teachers, we understand the value of having more time to explore and teach all the academic, social, and emotional areas. Children need this to build a solid foundation to be successful, not only in school, but in life. Full day kindergarten is an investment in the future of QCSD that applies to everyone in the entire community and not just a select few. With the rigor of the current kindergarten standards, two and a half hours does not allow enough time for in-depth instruction. Our full day kindergarten has its merits. However, students are homogeneously grouped and miss out on the opportunity to learn from peer models. Providing universal full day kindergarten would help to rectify the limitations of, the, of this current model. Our full day kindergarten program has been often been referred to as quote, the gift of time, unquote. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all of the children who grew up in our community had the equal opportunity to have that gift as well? The next comment is from Chris Cole of Richland Township. My question is regarding the winter keystones that students took in November of 2020 in lieu of the spring of 2019. Was there a mandated or established test submission window dictated by the state? If so, what exactly were those dates, start date and end date? Also, exactly what date were our students' tests submitted by the high school regarding the November round of tests? Many, many parents and students are frustrated at the idea that six months later, some of our kids may be needing to retake a test, pending results arriving in time or not. These kids will then be 12 months removed from the course in question should results not arrive. It seems crazy that six months later, scores are not processed. So please clarify the matter for parents to help us understand how exactly, how exactly it works. The next comment is from Catherine Infani of Milford Township. As planning begins for the 21-22 school year, I would like to emphasize the pandemic remains a reality. While the goal of the scientific community is to reach herd immunity as soon as possible, it is not only unknown when this will take place, but also unlikely that children will receive immunizations by the end of August. Variants are also a reality. Some seem to spread more easily and quickly than others do. When planning for the new school year, it is my hope that you take into consideration continued compliance with public health mitigation strategies, which in addition to vaccination include continued physical distancing, use of masks, hand hygiene, and isolation and quarantine. The next message is from Marion Huntsberger of Milford Township. I was hoping that you could keep the online learning the way it is now instead of the QFlex option, at least until the vaccines are approved and available for all the kids. Having live instruction with their teachers, being with their peers and their own school in a sense of normalcy for them and is, wor and is working very well. To take that away now and put into effect the QFlex would be very detrimental to them in their learning at this point in time. Thank you. Next message is from, sorry, <laughs> next message is from Mackenzie Huff. If, sport team, if sports teams are now allowed to be competing without masks, would it be possible for the students in the musical to be maskless while on stage? Since the performance is going to be outside, would it not be, equal, would it not be on equal footing with what the sports teams are doing? There would obviously have to be parameters set parameters set in, like students can only be maskless while on stage, but is, but is this something that could be considered? Thank you. And that is the end of public comments. Thank you. We got some extra public comment from, <laughs> from your doggy that my dog is the same, same way. <laughs> oh my that. goodness. When he wants to play, that's why uh, I have to keep him out of sight. Yeah, that, I, that I, would, I did want to ask the administration if um, the musical would fall under the uh, same guidance as the springtime sports or um, as, as far as the health and safety plan went, especially since it's outside, you know, the seats are pretty far away from the stage.
Dr. Harner? Let's answer that one. Oh, you're muted still. Oh, excuse me, and, and your question is what? Um, the the musical, I guess, which is in uh, late May. Yes, sir. It's in Univest. Yes. Um, so it is outside. It is, you know, the, the the stage is about 10 or 15 feet away from the first row of, of seats. There's only a few students on stage at a time. They are uh, physically exerting themselves on there. Does that I mean, I have spoken to Dr. Damsker on this, and he has mentioned before, too, that that would fall under the same guidance as um, springtime sports as well. So, I, you know, I, I haven't gone any further with it, but would, would they, would, is it an available option to the musical people for them to do that? I under was our talking, health and I was talking. Plan? I was in the director's uh, classroom today or this week, earlier this week. She did not bring that up to me, but I'll uh, go back and talk to her. And, and I, I don't think talk. she's bringing it up. <laughs> I think it's students bringing well, it up. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do some research and we'll report back by May 13th to the board or beforehand. If it's, if it's deemed to be safe and, and we're okay. Um, but thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up, Dr. Harner with your superintendent report. Looks like it's short today. Yes, ma'am, it is. Oh yeah, John Kearns is saying, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have a read-only report from the nurses. You have a report. Um, Joe, you, you, you let me share, so give me a second here. Oh, only the host. I'm trying to share Joe and it's not letting me get in. Do you want me to bring oh, it up there for you? you? There, there you, you go. It. There you go. Got it. If you can see the, um, this is, it came up in a previous board meeting from, uh, by Mr. Reimers. And we have uh, this uh, here, uh, an athletic report along with uh, their, their budget over time over the last couple of years. And what I asked Sylvia to do was to share with, uh, with me and then with, with uh, you all, how um, back 10 years ago, how we took some major hits. This is, was during the great recession and the results and it's declining budget. Um, the board decided uh, to start changing and start in investing in its, in its sports more Obviously, sports complex was part of it. Alumni field construction was, turfing was a part of it. Um, Rob, Christine, building the two, um, two uh, the visitor centers at Alumni Field and the concession bathrooms out at the sports complex. That's not included in, in these bar charts, but a major investment in sports and reinvesting in sports. And you can see where we're at over time. And I just wanted to give a quick snapshot there. And, and I expect in finance or in, and in education committees that we'll have more discussion about that. Um, I'll stop sharing on that one. Um, Joe, would you tee up briefly the health and safety um, report that says read only? Because there's a slide on there that I thought was important and the motion. Thank you. Um, if you go down to the next slide, I thought it'd be important for the board. This is, uh, wait, wait, I, I gotta get my video out of here. You can see this is a, a um, where we were uh, prior to um, modify quarantine. And I wanna give on the next slide, give you an idea of what it looks like now. This is a new slide. I know this is, John really appreciates his data stuff. So I wanted to put that out there. That's, that's in the slide deck. Give you a second there to look at it. The yellow being the modified quarantine. Also, what was uh, it? It's worked out, but it's a lot more work than, for the nurses than the other uh, quarantining process. A lot more research. Um, what you'll see in the nurses' report, they have found that uh, when students are modified quarantine, they're supposed to keep their masks on all the time, and that information's not 
um, either the students are coming in not knowing they're modified quarantine or saying their parents are not telling them that they're modified quarantine and they're unmasking, um, doing other things that they shouldn't be. And so there's a lot of modified quarantine police going on to following the rules and, and the nurses can't do it all themselves. But they, uh, that's mentioned, I believe, briefly in their report. Uh, could you, Joe, will you go to the recommendation could, slide? Could I just, could I just ask one question? I don't know, this might be for Nancy Ann who, the, I, I was just wondering about that, that new category of close contacts. The yes, yellow, sir, you go the back a slide, Joe. Thank you. Was, is that something newly added that we never tracked before? I think that's the folks that probably don't qualify for modified quarantine, but I could be wrong. So I guess, so I guess my, my primary concern is just that, is that artificially skewing the data? Like it looks dopey, it looks like I can't consider this the same data at, with that big yellow swath in there without understanding what the heck is that and why did it suddenly the, appear? Yeah, the close contacts that were there quarantined in the home, if that's what you're talking about with the red and then the yellow uh, modified quarantine where they're coming to school. But they have the provisional requirement to keep a mask on and so to me, that's the number of kids we saved from being exiled. Yes, sir. And 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 this is showing. I wouldn't use graph. those words, but yes, sir. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I exaggerate for effect, um, but yeah. So it's a little, a bit of a, not how I would choose to graph the information, but it's well sir we know we go back and forth on that and look forward to your input tomorrow or later on yeah, tonight yeah i'm sure before you go to bed you'll give us something yeah <laughs> but thank you for clarifying that i appreciate that some some students uh, or some parents have made decision if they've been um in a place to modify quarantine they also do stay home so um there there, there could be a little bit skewing there but the information is shared. Joe, um, go to the, the recommendation slide, which is later on in the in the meeting to, to approve. This is about the uh, the fogging emails that we've been receiving from from parents as a result of some of the other uh, another board meeting going down to uh, not doing it, but doing it once per week, and we do it going into the weekend, so we have plenty of time for it to the mist to evaporate and do it, do what it needed to do. So that's later on. Dr. Hunter, I, I did have a question about that graph as well. Sorry to, to no, it's all right. pick, pick on the graph. Um, I did see there was a green line uh, trending above that. Is there still people being quarantined for travel? Because I thought all of those travel restrictions were lifted. I don't see that as the green line. I see, a, I see a green line there, but that looks like that's dividing the yellow with the, with the, uh, the other. Okay, so we're not having, I mean, back in I, I, December, I'm, I know we had travel quarantine cases, yeah, quite yes, sir. a few. Yeah, they had I, think, I, think, I think the point is it's probably a zero. It just shows up as a line. Yeah, we need to work on the graph a little bit to make it better illustrate things we should be concerned about, not random data that no longer applies, so. I think you see down here in the center, if, if can you see, oh, that's not my arrow, it's Joe's arrow, excuse me, I'm pointing at the darn thing. Um, you can see in, in, in the center of the, the graph and it far to the left before the, uh, before the holidays, the winter holidays, you can see you do have with that green, bold green line, underneath it where the green area area is. So those were our folks that were on travel quarantine and uh, over to the right, far right near the yellow, you don't see it. Why should anybody be on travel quarantine anymore? I guess is the question. They, they, that's, we don't, we don't. That's what John was saying. It was, it's a, okay. a zero, but it, it is something we had been tracking. That's why it's out there. And that's where his, his critique of how we portray it could be different. Um, 
is there any questions on the defogging recommendation? I think that's pretty darn crystal clear. You've all been a part of that um, discussion. Uh, next topic, Joe, you can bring that down. Ma'am, that completes the superintendent's report. Whoa, that was good. That was short. Very well done. All right, we're going to move on to the next item on our agenda, which is our standing committee reports. Um, has Mr. Micucci joined us yet, or should I skip over his report and then see well, where? Salem Finance and Facilities are meeting next week, so I'm not okay. sure he has a report. Would that be correct, yeah, Zach? He's here. No, we had the special up. Oh, Keith is now. I we had the special meeting. Yeah, we had a just oh, just yeah. to let everybody know we had a special uh, finance meeting uh, last week uh, to or two weeks ago. Well, last week or two weeks ago, they run together That's anyway. Uh, anyway, we were discussing uh, the overall uh, board uh, budget for the 21-22 school year. Um, so it's I, I encourage anybody to the community to go back. I think it was recorded and, and we, we put it up there, but uh, it was uh, it was very enlightening. And I think there's some really good discussions that came out of it, uh, specifically around um, the key drivers that are affecting our budget for the 21-22 school year. Um, I think tonight we're voting on the preliminary uh, tax increase, but I just recommend that uh, everybody understands that this is, we, we may shoot high uh, while we still tease out the next, uh, over the next month, month and a half, uh, the final budget. So, uh, Zach, did I miss anything? Is there anything else you want me to uh, talk just about? To clarify, the proposed final budget will be May 13th. The final. Oh, it's May 13th. Be, that's it. Yeah, okay. and then the final will be June 10th. And if any board member has any questions before next week on any of the details from that last meeting, if you could please let uh, Dr. Harner and I know so that we can answer them at the upcoming uh, finance committee meeting. And that's never too many times to remind anybody who is listening that the bit of kabuki theater that is hoisted upon school boards regarding the, the budgeting process is such that we can always reduce to a lower tax later but we can't do it in reverse order. We can't change our mind. We can only we can only go one direction according to the to the state laws or regulations or something like that. So, so though we might declare some high level, like maybe we'll consider a three percent or whatever the the taxes were at this stage. That lets us delay the final decision and get more data between now and June. But the the point is, it's. Uh, it sometimes goes counter to all of our intentions. And it's just because of the constraints that the process puts upon us, we can't change our minds in both directions. We can only change our minds going one way, if that makes sense, which it probably doesn't, because it didn't sound very sensible when I said it. <laughs> it was very sensible, sir. But it's easier to change our mind and go down than it is to change our mind and right if if we committed to zero percent now and then some big balloon thing happens between now and june we can't go back yeah right and the reality is is that there's a lot of different cost drivers that we're considering for the upcoming year and i think you know it's worth for us to at least hold on to the options and you're right it's ridiculous that we have to do so so any vote that we make tonight can always be changed, um, but we can't, if we vote for zero, then we can't go back from that, simply put. And I think we vote May 13th, it's not tonight anyway, but yeah. Right, sorry, yes. Um, okay, I, Ma'am. yes. I, um, I'm gonna ask for an, an alibi here. Um, I left off my, I have counselors up on our screen um, if you remember, we, we talked earlier in the week, uh, uh, and then back in October about bringing the counselors back about reporting out on what their year has been so far, what they're seeing. And I've asked them all to speak just for a couple minutes. So there, John, you can start the clock ticking again under superintendent's report. 
Um, but, and Joe, would you, our Erica, uh, Christy and, and Maureen, um, we love hearing you. from our guidance counselors. I, it would be a and, pleasure. And I'll start with the high school with uh, Erica Henry. She's one of our guidance counselors at the high school. What I, I did a couple of weeks ago was to sit down and, and hear out uh, at each building level some of the things, and there are obviously trends uh, that are out there, mental health, as the board knows, but the community who hasn't been listening in the past may not know that it, this is uh, – you know, the COVID might have been the earthquake, but the tsunami afterwards is mental health concerns and, and things like that. Um, we've spent a lot of time behind the curtain, a lot of time with families and our counselors with kids, our school psychologists. So I wanted to, to give them some time for that's on the record for the board's education um, and that the community can, can tune into when they have the time to listen to their expertise and, and share their wi wisdom. So. Um, Eric, I'll let you start at the high school first and, sure. and talk through, then we'll work our way down. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I wanted to start with some positive aspects that we've experienced this year, and um, then I will talk about some of the challenges that we've noticed. So I'd like to um, highlight the staff at the high school, the teachers, special ed teachers, aides, support staff, nurses, cafeteria, facilities, I hope I'm not forgetting anybody. Um, the willingness to help and go that extra mile has been huge. Um, a lot of teamwork and collaboration, positive attitude, and a lot of flexibility uh, to work with the, the needs of the students. Uh, we also talked about having some really meaningful conversations with both students and families feel like people are opening up a little bit more, um, sharing the struggles that they're having. And uh, we appreciate that because it helps us to work as a team, which is another positive aspect. We have a lot of collaboration with parents and families this year, um, all of us wanting to support the students. The gross majority of our students are doing very well and we love to see the resilience, their hard work and their determination. Um, they're learning and practicing some of the skills for success that they, they need in a more independent setting at times. Um, they're communicating with teachers, managing their time, organization and problem solving is great, and I'm um, seeing a lot of self-advocacy. We've also noticed a lot of generosity from students and families, um, kindness throughout the community, and caring about each other. Um, in the high school, we have a program called Q Rock. I want to... Uh, highlight and what we recognize in students staff will uh, recognize individual students for acts of resilience ownership community and kindness and i feel like that really contributes to a positive environment at the school and we also would like to say uh, we really appreciate the addition of a, another sap counselor a student assistance program counselor and they have been an invaluable support to our students and the families. Some of the challenges that we have had to deal with, as Dr. Harner um, alluded to, the mental health um, situation that we're in, there's so many people that are struggling, so many students um, working with families that they're reaching out for help. And what we're finding is that there are some roadblocks in, in community resources because of the backlog of clients that they have. Um, so, Again, we appreciate our SAP counselors because they're serving as an interim until families are able to get those community resources and they can provide the support and counseling that students need in the meantime. Definitely have noticed that anxiety is up with our students' uh, frustration levels and some of the students are showing. If we talk about truancy, um, we averaged or, or, or we looked at about 3% of our students that we would say are really disengaged from the process uh, despite numerous attempts for meetings, communication methods, um, the social worker has done house visits and citations have been filed as well. We have noticed that children and youth and district court are uh, limited resources at this time um, to support the intervention, interventions that we're trying to put in place for the students and families. Some families have not responded to multiple communication attempts by the school. And uh, we've also noticed that students are on who are on kind of that ADHD 
uh, spectrum and the bubble are coming to the surface. And Dr. Kelly has been a tremendous support for those students and uh, is working with evaluating them and determining if, if we need to put additional supports in place for them. So that is what we've noticed in the high school that we really wanted to share with everybody. One, one last thing I'd like to add is that the students had an opportunity, what, two weeks ago for the college fair? Yes, yes. And I, and I was really excited about it. Eric Gossard, the guidance counselors, put it mm -hmm. all together. Um, and Penn State University told us, and I think I shared this with the board, but for the community, Penn State uh, admissions, they said we were the only one, uh, invite that they had for the entire year. Wow. So I hats off to our counselors and putting that together and all the teachers that helped sponsor that, that sponsored the individual sessions. Naturally, you know where I went with my alum stuff. So I, I did help out a little bit. Anyway, Maureen, you're up. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Maureen Clunin, counselor over at Strayer Middle School. And I also wanted to start with some positives. Um, kids are smiling and playing again and the comfort level is up. And I think since we hit marking period three, that, that uh, maths that made them feel like they couldn't talk or they couldn't socialize, they're, they're feeling like they're part of the community again. Um, it's so nice, especially with the weather right now, you walk outside, you're going home and you're seeing the fields full of kids playing, playing their sports. But you also see a, lo a lot of virtual clubs are still going on. And even our mask breaks during the school day, you see the kids not just standing there in a line, but they're they're running around and, and um, they're starting to enjoy themselves again. Uh, but the other notice, the thing that I noticed was the, um, the breakfast program, which we've had the whole year. Um, the kids are actually eating breakfast again. They're in the cafeteria, they're six feet apart, but you hear the laughter and you, and you see them using the little bit of, of social availability that we have. So that's a real plus. There are a lot more students returning, uh, more and more, and I contribute this to the parents sharing with me that they have a lot more people at home that are vaccinated. Um, parents are going back to work. Um, the academic need that the parents can't sustain it at home so that they know that, that they, are, they have to trust us and they are finding that there is a trust now for the health and safety plan that we have in place at Strayer and the sixth grade center. So we're seeing a lot of um, students returning. And um, one of the things that it, I can echo that uh, Erica had shared is anxiety is still very high and it is um, high with the kids that are returning. So they, some of the seventh graders and maybe the sixth graders as well, they haven't even entered our building yet. So what we're doing to help them is giving them tours and a lot of TLC and and just helping them become part of our community very quickly. The teachers are welcoming them back, knowing them from being a virtual name on the computer, now seeing them live in person. So they're feeling that again. And what we're noticing is that their grades are rising very quickly. The other thing with the, the anxiety is that um, we have implemented uh, with the district's help, the aim and act lessons to our faculty and um, working with everybody in the building with our um, with our positive program and our, our culture, the kids are understanding the coping skills for anxiety a lot better. Um, we are seeing um, an uptick of kids that are feeling very hopeless to be able to reach out and call a suicide hotline. Um, we're seeing that up. We're seeing the number of attempts down, which is really good. Um, we have a big uptick in um, safe to say tips for kids helping kids. And uh, a big shout out again to my tech people. Um, the tech alerts that we get as counselors when the, somebody's, when a child is on their computer and they start typing in self harming words, that gets alerted to us so that we're able to contact these kids within minutes and reach out to their families. So with all of that support, these kids that are feeling anxiety or feeling um, that mental health piece of, of COVID and the crisis, we're getting them hooked up with, with help. Um, 
we are doing a lot with the kids that are returning, a lot of creative modifications in the schedule and also our teachers are amazing. I've never seen teachers work so hard to take their curriculum and know how to modify it, change it, make it work for kids that have gaps in their, their knowledge um, and be able to bring them back in and be a part of that curriculum again. So um, huge, huge shout out to all of uh, the staff. They are amazing, amazing people. Um, there are still a high number of students failing for the year. If it wasn't for the district policy with the lowest grade we can give a child is a 50%, that's what's saving these kids. They're coming back, maybe having zeros across the board and starting school marking period three or four with being able to have that 50% as a way of them starting fresh. We're able to, to work hard with our um, programming to get them through the year. We will still have a small cluster of kids that have done little to nothing for the year. And we're looking at um, a high number of kids that are gonna need summer school or um, I don't even know what the district will do if the kids, um, if they're gonna be retained or not. Our SAP program, uh, we have the highest number of referrals this year to our SAP program. We have about 99 kids referred so far this year. Uh, last year at this time, now again, it was COVID, uh, we had 55 at the end of March and the year before that we had about 105. So we have 99 now, we still have two months left. Um, about approximately 30 of those referrals were of suicide ideation and gestures. So there is still that mental health piece of COVID out there that um, we're still working really hard. Um, I, like Erica said, the um, SAP counselors are amazing because there is a wait list for kids to go into treatment. There's a wait list for them to get therapy and um, most of the therapy is online. So we're doing our best also with, with um, virtual appointments as well that we've been providing for kids. Uh, our SAPE for, for attendance purposes, SAPE standing for the Student Attendance Improvement Plan. We've done uh, a tremendous amount of those planning meetings to help kids find what is their barrier of getting to school and helping them get through those barriers so that they can um, attend and find their hope in passing the school year. Um, and then lastly, I know that there are families out there that, are, that have the struggling kids with these grades and, and they are wondering what's gonna happen over the summer or for next year. That's what I have for the middle school. Christy and Steph, you're up. And you have a presentation, Joe. I think you have to tee something up. Not that. <laughs> okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Stephanie Rogers, and with me is my colleague and fellow school counselor, Christy Carlson. We are the school counselors at Poff Elementary School. Thank you for giving us time this evening to speak on behalf of our elementary colleagues with an update regarding celebrations and challenges that we have seen this school year. To begin with some celebrations at the elementary level. The elementary student assistant program is an integral part of our elementary schools every year but especially during this challenging school year. ESAP is designed to support students experiencing barriers to learning. This school year, our ESAP counselors have helped to service close to 300 students by providing community resources, one-on-one -on -one counseling, and or group counseling. We are incredibly appreciative of the assistance we have received from our ESAP counselors, Trish Watkins and Amy Bocklet, as they have helped us to support our students and families. In addition, the 30-minute th social-emotional learning block continues to be an asset to our school communities. This designated period of time has been invaluable in building classroom unity, teaching students important life skills, and supporting students' mental health. During this SEL block, some of us have had the opportunity to deliver second-step program through live instruction or pre-recorded videos. 
Second step is an evidence-based approach to teaching SEL age-appropriate lessons that are fun and engaging. These lessons teach skills for learning, empathy, emotional management, and problem-solving skills. Teachers are able to model, reinforce, and use the common language taught in second step lessons in their classrooms. In alignment with the superintendent goals, our elementary schools have been working diligently to implement tier two strategies for PBIS at POF, Quakertown, and Trumbowersville elementary schools, and the continued implementation of Leader in Me at NIDIG and Richland elementary schools. For the development and implementation of tier two, we are analyzing universal screener data to ensure we are providing interventions for behavioral at-risk students. This includes both internalizing and externalizing behaviors, such as stealing, peer rejection, negative attitude, aggressive behavior, loneliness, and anxiety. Richland and NIDIG Leader and Me leadership teams have been very busy working towards shared building-wide goals, giving back to the community, reaching academic goals, and embracing challenges. Richland's leader, leadership team helped to coordinate a food drive for the Quakerton Food Pantry where 500 items were collected and donated. Great, Joe, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so along with the celebrations, we also continue to face some challenges. Some of our elementary schools are seeing an increase in threats. These threats include self-harm comments and or threats towards others. Some schools have also seen an increase in flagged safety checks. When these situations arrive, we as school counselors use the QCSD established protocol. At the elementary level, some of us have seen an increase in anxiety in our students. While most students have settled into a routine, we have observed that a portion of our students are presenting with symptoms of anxiety. For some students, this looks like nervousness, crying, or the inability to focus in school, while for others, it has led to a lack of engagement and school avoidance. The greatest challenges we have seen for some of our virtual students are a lack of engagement, difficulty keeping up with their assignments, and an absence of peer relationships. This includes inconsistent attendance and participation in Google Meets for live instruction, submission of assignments that are partially or inaccurately completed, or numerous missing assignments. Although attendance in Google Meets is not mandatory, we have found that those students who do attend are more likely to have an established routine and complete assignments accurately and on time. We have worked diligently with students and families throughout the year to navigate the transition back to live instruction for those students who have opted to change their instructional model. Joe, if you could switch, thank you. <laughs> As we approach the close of another school year, we are planning for the start of another. We are currently working with our sixth grade center colleagues to plan for course selection for our rising sixth graders. We will continue to support any students that may transition to in-person instruction this school year. In addition, we will begin to plan for students that may return to, to live instruction this year. Those students that will be new to our buildings as a result of redistricting, those students that previously attended QCSD and will be returning, and our incoming kindergarten students. We will continue to review data to determine how we can best support our struggling students and their families. And our final slide, in closing, whether we're discussing highlights or challenges, the continued focus on the social emotional health of our school community is critical and we are grateful that QCSD has put social emotional learning for students, staff and families front and center in our schools. While Steph and I can speak specifically about POF, we're fairly certain that our colleagues could echo our sentiments and saying that we are exceedingly grateful for and proud of the work our teachers, instructional aides, secretaries, administrators, custodial staff, food service staff, support staff, and bus drivers have done to make this year a success for our students. We will continue to work together through the final push to provide our students and families with the tools and resources they need Thank you again for allowing us time to speak this evening and thank you all for the work you do and supporting the QCSD community. Very well done. For our counselors. I would just ask, how are you all doing and holding up? 
because it looks challenging. So thank you. We're definitely going to need our summers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank when you we... for asking. I think we're all all hanging in, but yeah. um, it's definitely good to have each other to to lean on and the support of um, Janet and Dr. Harner and and our administrators to to rely on when we need things. Agree. Ladies, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you pulling together everyone else's thoughts. Um, it, these are, it's just the tip of the iceberg or what I heard, I guess it was two weeks ago now. And then as what I'm learning when I walk around, um, obviously the common theme of the issues is the increasing anxiety. Um, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm seeing the nods there. That That's the big buzzword. Um, which what you're going to see that's really good for the board uh, next week we have the steering committee meeting for the, uh, the comprehensive plan the next three years or next four years of our work and then at the next board meeting the comprehensive plan will be briefed out to the entire school board um, which tightly connects mental health with SEL and with academics and then also Zach has a piece on how we're going to pay for it so um, uh, so anyway, that so we're connecting the dots really well, and these ladies and and all their colleagues out there doing a fantastic job. So thank you, ma'am. Now, now, John, you can stop the clock. You can, I'm back on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys so much for giving us that presentation, I, and I appreciate that question from Mr. Kern because it absolutely is one of the most challenging years for educators as well as for our counselors and staff members. Um, so you deserve that summer this year, probably more than um, past years. And I think one of the things, um, maybe one of the silver linings from all of this is that we have been focusing on social and emotional learning. And I hope that we can continue to put such an emphasis on that as in the upcoming years, because it's highly beneficial for our mental health of our students. So thank you guys so much for your time. All right, I'm gonna move on in our agenda here where we left off. I'm gonna to go to Mr. Akmanowitz uh, for the tech update. Um, some of the things that we did at the past meeting, we approved the four day work week for the staff over the summer, which is traditionally something that we do every year. Uh, they streamline uh, 10, four, uh, four tens and uh, they all have off on Friday. It saves on electricity and stuff. Uh, we invested in some new HR software, a substantial amount of money, so I felt the need to mention it, about $14,000. Uh, the senior ceremony is scheduled for June 7th. Um, this, month's student of the, <clears throat> this month's student of the month is uh, Jacqueline Glock. Jacqueline's a carpentry, carpentry uh, student from Quakertown, so I just wanted to say congratulations to her. Gluck, it's Gluck, I'm sorry. Um, we are currently undergoing a review of our special education programs with the Bucks County Intermediate Unit, uh, performed some policy updates, we paid some bills, did some hiring. We renewed our business services contract with the Bucks County Intermediate Unit. May 8th, um, we approved the Bucks County Recycling um, event uh, to be done at the Bucks County Technical Center. Uh, Gary, if you're listening, uh, maybe you could uh, locate that <clears throat> Bucks County distribution with the recycling center and uh, pass it amongst our social media. Um, and we also talked about the baking and cooking programs at a special meeting, as well as uh, at the board meeting. Um, there has been some talk amongst the administration and the board for a little while about combining the cooking and the baking program. Um, I'm not going to take much time to talk much about that, but Chris, is there anything you felt the need to talk about? Um, you know, since you'll be around next year and it's kind of in your court, I um, thought maybe uh, you might want to say something about it. Yeah, well, you know, after the initial um, the initial introduction to the JOC uh, about the merging of those programs and the uh, the large public outcry too, um, we, we did sort of look back on that and uh we're going to delay it for another year 
Uh, and we're also looking at the possibility of moving with a pathways program where the kids would possibly start out with both instructions for the first year and then be able to branch off into culinary and baking. And they can get some of those combined requirements taken care of like washing dishes that are that overlap in both of those programs done during that period. So it's still a work in progress, but, but we feel now there's going to be less friction the, the the parents the students and you know hopefully the teachers and administration go along with it and i look forward to having involvement involvement with dr hoffman and dr harner along with um, the tech school administration and the other two sending districts too and there is a committee that is being put together to discuss which way we're going to move forward correct yeah now i'm sure they're open to feedback to anybody from the community and uh, I, that concludes my personal report, if anybody else has anything. I enjoyed my dishwashing days, and then I graduated to pot washer. Mm. And then went on from there. Good, good curriculum. Yeah. Good character building. KP, right, Dr. Harner? Mm. I don't know. Did officers have to do KP? <laughs> mm. When we went to the field, I would cook the uh, omelets and eggs to order. Very nice. Yeah, it's always a good thing, I think, to learn. Um, all right. So, Mr. Jackson, I think that you are on, and I just want to confirm that you can hear us and give us a, your report. I know that you're going to be um, on your mobile, so just wanted to check in. How's my mobile today, Mr. Reimers? Much better than your uh, Wi-Fi, apparently. <laughs> Okay, um, the IU met um, a couple of weeks ago and um, included in your um, agenda items are the uh, minutes from that meeting and the awesome news to highlight some of the great things that the IU is doing. Please review that. I will note that the uh, governor did stop by the IU earlier this month to observe some of the vaccination. I got a chance to hang with the governor for a day. That was always fun. Um, so take a look at that as it will. Um, let's see, the next meeting is, um, the, my next report is the legislative report. Um, that's in, also included in the um, presentation there. One thing I want to highlight about legislative report, a couple things is one, uh, the election is coming up for the primary election. So everybody please get out and vote. But also of particular interest is the, um, ballot questions regarding um, constitutional amendments regarding the powers of the governor during emergency issues. So that's, that's a good reason to go out there and to make your opinion, your uh, beliefs known that uh, go through the legislative um, stuff that has been uploaded at your leisure. Lastly, the Ed Foundation. The Ed Foundation met earlier this month. The um, there was really not much to talk about. We are doing some more fundraising, um, looking at ways to give out money to people. Uh, the music was touched on earlier in our meeting. Uh, it's going to happen over at the center in Quakertown. I do want to brag a little bit and say the Ed Foundation was happy to contribute uh, some funds to uh, help with the cost to rent that facility. So that's a, a little plug for the Ed Foundation doing good work in our community. Uh, that is the extent of my reports. All right, thank you, sir. Appreciate those reports. I am uh, gonna move on to our fiscal consent agenda. So on that agenda, we have uh, Power School enrollment projection software. Chris, did you wanna take that one out? I think um, do that one separate. Yeah, I did, I did wanna vote on that separate. So then you need to, can you make a motion? I would like to make a motion to remove the uh, line. I hope my mouse isn't working here. Uh, come on. Line out of May. Uh, mm. Line A, yes. <laughs> I would like um, to make a motion to remove line A, the Power School Enrollment Projection Software Agreement. Okay, second. I'll second it. Okay, O'Brien. And let's have a discussion. Can you just share with us briefly why that you um, wanted to motion for that? Um, I, 
I didn't want to necessarily vote on that along with everything else because uh, I, I I don't believe that this software is necessarily um, or not even software that this this projection is the right uh, one that we would need to use moving forward. Um, again, I, I would uh, I, I did send out an email to the board members of that that study that the Montgomery County uh, Planning Commission does for their districts, and it is much more comprehensive. A lot different, and I believe for the money here, um, you know, I believe this was sixteen thousand dollars that um, we could probably work with our county and get a study more tailored to what our district needs are and what our community's needs are than going with a national company to just come in and essentially do what Nancy Ann's been doing, you know, using birth data and and township um, planning data. Hey, Caleb, since I'm away from my desk, can you clarify uh, whether or not the vote for that software is to actually purchase and use it at this time? In other words, there's been a debate among some of the board members whether we even want to have any kind of outside um, company, whether or not we even wanted to spend any money when we have the administration giving us, you know, routinely accurate and wholly adequate numbers. Is this item on the agenda to literally purchase that and utilize it to do the same thing the administration has been doing all along? Yes, it is a motion to approve the agreement. Okay, then I would, I would, I would like to vote on that one separately. Yeah, and that's, and that's gonna be, that's what's on the floor right now is the motion to go ahead and do that one separately. So um, is it okay if we vote on that guys? Yeah. Since I'm the only girl, I can say that. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, all right, so the motion on the floor is to vote on item A separately. <laughs> and um, I'll just go ahead and um, say all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed to that? All right, the motion for that um, carries unanimously. So let's go ahead and vote now first on the items, um, the additional items on that agenda, and that is items B through H. I'll read them aloud. This is the approval um, for the agreement with Action Party Rentals, approval of the agreement with Nick Luco. I hope I said that correctly. Approval of water filtration and service rental agreement with Quench USA. Approve three-year contract with Seesaw. Approve contract with TRA for Chromebook repair coverage. SHI as a co co-star vendor in accordance with the technology lease for 21-22. And approval of additional licenses for CSTAG threat assessment training from Navigate 360. So I'll need a motion to vote on those items. So moved. Second, Mr. Akmanowitz. Is there a discussion? I, I did have a question with the uh, the repair contract uh, for Chromebooks. Um, is that something that we have always done outsourced? Or I, I, I seem to recall Joe's team saying how much work they've been doing all, all year uh, repairing <laughs> people's laptops. So is this something new where you'd be sending them out? Or is this... You know, yeah, so if you, there is a, a, one other attachment in there that I just kind of put uh, kind of what we're doing now versus using that. So basically what we do now, we self-insure. So we charge parents who opt in $35 uh, and we just, you know, bank on the fact that we'll end up in the black and not in the red. Uh, but we found over this past year with all the shortages, prices for parts have uh, doubled, if not tripled, and the availability is very low. So what this company does, the very good reference checks that I've had. Uh, it would only cost parents $25 uh, and they would handle all of our repairs for those insured ones. We would still, anybody who doesn't opt in, we would still continue to maintain those, but they have a close relationship with large uh, parts distribution. So we're saving our, our parents money uh, and we're also uh, protecting ourselves from possibly ending in the red. So, I mean, from a fiscal standpoint, it's really a zero cost. We're just providing a cheaper option to our parents and actually um, a more complete option as well. 
Would this all uh, add more time on to, you know, if somebody brought a laptop in for repairs and it needed to be, you know, I guess weekly picked up weekly from this company and then returned weekly? You know? uh, no. So what, what they do and what we've always done, uh, they provide us a loaner fleet okay. so that we can swap those out. You know, the hard part right now, Chris, is the fact that some of these parts we can't even get in. Uh, so having a large warehouse of people that, you know, this is their business, uh, it just takes that that off of us. And I feel more confident with them doing it than ourselves right now, especially with the price and availability. So, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The motion carries unanimously for items B through H. So let's go ahead and um, talk about item A. I'll need a motion um, to approve or not approve <laughs> item A. Yes. You need a motion yeah. to approve. You need a motion to approve it. Yeah. Okay. So can I get a motion? I'll make a motion, Mr. Akmanowitz. I'll second. All right, Chris, it's your moment to shine. What you got to say? Oh, I already said it. I mean, this pretty much, like I said, it's, it's not really much more comprehensive than what um, we've been doing in the district. And for to pay $16,000 for it, I, I don't believe it would be worth the cost to do that. Um, like I said, this, I this came to the district now. committee. That's after the discount. Yeah, I think it, it did go down a little bit. I, I was looking at the original number here, but um, this this came from the redistricting committee that did say that that we should probably look into something like this, and I agree with them. But I don't think this is the right product. Um, I, I just want to ask the administration: Didn't you guys say that you guys usually spot check every few years on something like this with an outside agency, and kind of this is to that same thing? Sir, we've, um, since I've been here, Nancy has performed this service. Okay. We've never used an outside agency to spot check numbers. It, 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 we did it um, prior to the construction and the renovation of the high school. And that was, it, it forecasted it wrong. It said we were going to 6,000 students, by the way. And, and, and the high school was built larger than for more than it was that we're going to have because we're going to be declining 400 students in the high school and here in another couple of years. I mean, to Chris's point, do we want this? Not, not this no. product. I, I believe, like I said, that the example I shared with you all on an email before the meeting was uh, a, a report that the Montgomery County Planning Commission does for all the Montgomery County schools. I believe that that one is a little more hyper local. It, it, it deals with the school district's needs directly. And it is, you know, I, I think that's the, the style of enrollment report that we should use. So, yeah. It, to, it, to it, Chris's it, point, it, it, to Chris's point, the administration supports that, kicking it back to the facilities committee, to what Chris brought up in his own committee, because he's the facilities chair, that um, the, the Bucks County ha is developing or is uh, creating a function to be able to do what Montgomery County does. And let's see where that goes. Yeah. But right uh, now we know where we're going to be. We have a good idea where we're going to be for next year. Um, and so we've got time. So my rec recommendation is support um, saying no. <laughs> and Chris, I, Chris, and I don't want to speak. Uh, Chris, I don't want to speak for you. Um, so before I say, well, this is what Chris said. Can you again reiterate for the benefit of us and the audience listening why you think we should not continue with Nancy Ann's, what she's been doing very well, very accurately for the last six or seven years, why you feel it's necessary to even consider spending any money for either any person, any organization to do something else? Okay, that I can do. Um, so where I have any doubts in what we do is from examples from other school districts in our own state and across the country, 
where they've had predictions based basically exactly how we've been doing on live birth data and on permitting stages in townships or cities that these school districts reside and examples of those going horribly wrong and school districts then being stuck having to condemn land to build buildings that they don't have the space to build or the budgets to build. So where, and, and every example says they always classify it as an unprecedented or an unexpected population boom. It happens all the time. I mean, not all the time. We've been lucky so far. We haven't had that. And Nancy Ann's predictions have been very good because of that. We have not had one of these spikes, but it, it's something that could happen. And it's not always necessarily because they built a 2000 unit development in there. Sometimes populations just turn over where older populations move, move out, younger people move in to older yeah. houses. Yeah. So basically this, what this does is if you look at that example, when I gave it to you, it gives you potential for development and potential for growth. You know, it, it examines the age demographics of the population. It, it examines the developable land in an area to say this is an area that can grow in the future. So where it might be a good idea to hold on to your buildings or something like that, because where you're not predicted to grow in the next three or four or five years, you have the potential to grow exponentially in eight, nine, 10 years. So these studies are a little more comprehensive and they take into account all of that information that, that Nancy Ann's study just doesn't do. It couldn't, couldn't do. Okay, so th there's Chris's presentation of why he thinks it's important. Now, it, to, to d respond directly to Chris's points, I disagree that Nancy Ann isn't providing a comprehensive analysis. You could say that these other organizations do additional uh, number crunching and say that perhaps that's important. I disagree. I believe Nancy Ann's numbers historically are very, very perfect. You know, per perfect's a bad word. They've been very accurate, very informed, and very spot on to what has actually happened in our district. Now, Ron, the other point... The could I just... Excuse me for interrupting, but I, I'm just going to ask if, if at some point in the future we discuss the need for this again, we'll have to repeat this argument. At the moment, there's something on the table that we need to deal with, and I suggest we just deal with that and then save this discussion for when we need to have it because I don't uh, it, we'll goes the, it. it goes to the heart of why we're spending this money. But so we're not spending, spending it unless we vote for it tonight. I don't think I we'll know. <laughs> Mike, well, I don't know, but Chris's point was simply that you can't plan for the, the unexpected. I mean, all of these, well, neither can, neither can any of these companies, anybody would want to buy. They can't all plan they for do the is unexpected. Give you the potential. They give you the potential. And then there's always potential. There's always potential. It's, it's ridiculous to say that these organizations <laughs> are any better at planning for the what ifs. That's ridiculous. So why don't we see what I, the county comes up all with? All right. I so, think that everybody, you guys have both yeah. made your points. So, Dave, Please. did you have something? Can I make a motion to table it or? No, well, no we're just going to vote it down. Yeah. All right, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. I just want to get past this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I appreciate the deliberations. I, I agree with um, John that I think that th if we should revisit this at some point, I also appreciate, you know, what Ron was saying, just trying to fundamentally understand where the board was, but I think that we understand at least both the different arguments. So I'm gonna recommend that we go ahead and vote for this. Um, Terry, can we do this one as a roll call just in case? And just as a reminder, a vote of yes means that we approve the contract. A vote of no means we do not approve the contract with Power School. Okay. Uh, Mr. Reimer. No. Mr. Spear. No. Mr. Akmanowitz. No. Uh, Mr. Kern. No. Mrs. Mitchell. No. Mr. Micucci. So I'm not here. Mr. Jackson. No. Mr. Klein. No. Okay. 
motion fails. Right. Gonna move on now to our facilities consent agenda. And on that is the approval of the proposal with environmental control systems, as well as approving the updated health and safety plan. As a reminder, the administration recommends amending the health and safety plan to conduct sanitizing and fogging. Um, I shouldn't just say it's really the fogging once per week instead of nightly. So this change does not affect the required deep cleaning that occurs each time there is a positive case in a building. So I'll need a motion to approve those items. So moved, Mr. Klein. I'll second, Mr. Spear. Any discussion? I just had a question about the, uh, the fogging. If we were doing it every night and the proposal is to go to once a week, I believe you said on a Friday night, uh, what's the value of fogging at all then? Um, and will that fogging, whatever it is, will that last throughout the week? Uh, I I'll go to the experts. It, it, the logic is that it, is to eliminate what's there, and mm -hmm. and with no students in the room or teachers in the room, then there's not a problem over the weekend. But Rob, are you, uh, Joe? Would you elevate Rob, who is doing supervises this work? Also, while Rob's coming up, my other question would be uh, about the. Um, uh, ingredient list of the the fogging agent i know there was some talk about that and yeah. i couldn't find yes, that yes sir i answered um the parents uh, information right. I, I couldn't find it so i didn't know if if i missed it or uh, it's, i had it's answered her question it was a link off the website has all the chemicals and all the information word for i just couldn't find it Do, would you like it to be sent to you sir were you using Ron Jackson's Wi-Fi? Is that why? <laughs> Could have been. I'd also like to hear the the logic of using a Friday instead of say a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night in the middle of the week. I think that would make more sense. Go ahead, yes. Rob. We we were talking Friday night or even potentially on a Saturday. That way there wouldn't be any staff or students in the building. I mean, that it's been brought up that due to sanitizing in the morning, we're not finishing until roughly six o'clock, quarter after six, depending on what the billing is. And some staff members are coming in earlier and that, that's where the concern came to fruition. So if we did it over the weekend, like a Saturday, we're still paying overtime on a Saturday or for that one hour during a weekly. So that's what we're still gonna discuss, whether it's gonna be a Friday or a Saturday morning. It would make more sense that it would be in the middle of the week though, rather than on the weekend. Um, that way, if anybody had came in in the beginning of the week and they had started spreading germs on things, at least halfway through the week, we would cont um, contain it. Correct. I mean, it, it still goes back to a staffing issue with us taking over for SSC. And for my team to be doing it, to come back at nighttime after custodians have cleaned. So they're here at five o'clock in the morning, some guys, and they'd be here till 2.30, and then they have to come back again at 10 o'clock after the custodians are finished, that that creates a very, very long day and I wouldn't get home till after midnight. So, and also, sir, I think it goes back to the CDC's report and findings about, about high, uh, touching and surfaces and transmission of the virus. Um, very they're low. finding very that low. that's, it's yeah. very low. So that was the big reason why it wasn't every day. And, and we, to meet the requirement that we get it done and, um, and have it done. We do it you once gotta, a week. You got to remember, from for, for a timing from the middle school and high school perspective, kids do not go home at two thirty. Kids are there until sometimes until nine or ten at night, along with teachers with various after school activities. Certainly, when the musicals and the band performances happen, I mean, this is not a building that shuts down at three o'clock every night. Yeah, I think that all those points are really well made because. We know that we didn't do fogging right before this year. So then, I mean, the only reason we brought on the fogging was initially because we didn't know to the extent that surfaces would be a, you know, a spreader of the virus. But now that we know that it's not, it's not, you know, it, it feels like this is the right decision to make, um, especially when you consider all the staffing challenges associated with it. So I was on a 
conference call today with the company seeking our services and happened to watch some of their videos of their robotic systems that run a UV, a UV light through buildings. So, that, you know, it is automatable with robots, just saying. <laughs> not, not a drone yet. There's not a drone. But it was, <laughs> not a drone this time. <laughs> but it was a robot with a UVC light on it that they programmed to run, you know, it's like, like your vacuum cleaner things. John, I saw a video of a drone painting a, a, a silo. So I think uh, spray painting a silo or spraying cool. out fogging material, you know, you can do it with a drone. Trust me. Yeah. Well, John has a project now. There you go. <laughs> All right. Um, I think that we've had some adequate discussion in regards to this. So I'm going to go ahead and say we move on to the vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, that motion carries unanimously. We're going to move on to our human resources consent agenda. On that is professional staff, supervisory and techno technology staff, support staff, substitute aides, and unit pay. So I'll need a motion for those. So moved, Mr. Rimers. Second it, Mr. Klein. Discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next is our Office of Teaching and Learning Consent Agenda. We have the approval of the Memorandum of Understanding for the 21-22 Early Childhood Programs. That is with the Bucks County IU. Approval of developing an option for cyber instruction. And just so I'm very clear on this, um, the motion to, um, or that I should say the vote for this and the motion for this is not any specific program, rather to give the approval of some type of cyber instruction model for the 21-22. And that gives the administration the flexibility to start um, looking into options for that. And we also have the approval of the school start times for the 21-22 school year. I'll need a motion. So moved. Second. I'll second. Okay, so let's discuss this. And I, one thing I want us to make sure that we mentioned that we did get a lot of feedback from the sixth grade center perspective in regards to the change that could affect, um, could affect you know, some of the activities, the after school activities. So I would like for uh, the administration to have the opportunity to chat about that because I know I, we talked about that, Dr. Harner, um, last week, or uh, I'm sorry, early this week and so we have some ideas on how we can work around that, but you also had some comments about it. So um, would you like to discuss that for us? Yes, ma'am. Um, big picture for this, for the board, for the community, um, is making this the, the transition to having an earlier start time or a later start time for the high school and fitting thing, everything after that, as I explained in my blog and, and to everybody, um, is to have a couple things. One, to have professional development uh, before the school day starts. Two, to have later start times for the high school and, and also to do it at minimum cost to the district at no cost right now, the way it's set up with this particular start time. If you look at our enrollment for next year, where our break point is, we need to have a lot of, to have enough buses that the existing bus to get the work done and at no cost, additional cost to the budget is the sixth graders next year would have to go with um, the K through five students to school. In the future years and in, in another year or two, that, that won't exist and then we'll be able to go with the high school students. But for next year, the start time would align the sixth graders there. So that's that's one key point. Um, and, and talking with Dr. Bubser, and I have Eric uh, here, Eric here. Ah, there you are, sir. Good to see you this evening. Long time, it's been a couple hours. Um, 
the uh, working working with uh, Dr. Bupser, she says the big things are uh, what a couple parents said, I believe in comments tonight, you've received about six emails, five emails, that it's, uh, it's about the musical and it's about cheerleading. Um, sixth graders participate in, in, in some middle school sports, um, but I think there's about the, uh, their grade level about what they can do with middle school sports is also an issue. I asked Eric and, and Jen to talk about it. Jen is not with us tonight, Dr. Bubster, the middle school principal, but Eric is, and I asked him to kind of talk about what we're gonna do at least for next year. Thank you, Dr. Harner. Thank you, board members. So th this, this proposed change does obviously put the Sixth Street Center on an elementary bell schedule or en start and end times. So the, the, over the past couple of years, as the Sixth Grade Center has been uh, in existence, we have had sixth graders participate in a number of activities at Strayer Middle School, as well as some seventh and eighth graders come to the Sixth Grade Center to participate in activities and clubs after school. With the proposed changes, we obviously, as an administrative team and staff, would have to pivot. Uh, our, our plan is to continue to offer opportunities, but they may look a little different. Um, with the proposed end time for L or for the middle school, for I'm sorry, for the sixth grade center being about 3:40 in the afternoon, it would um, still allow time for students to travel from the sixth grade center to Strayer on a shuttle bus, which was the past practice uh, in previous years where students would get on a shuttle bus at the end of the day, travel to Strayer or students at Strayer would travel to the sixth grade center and do their clubs. In some cases, the, their time in the clubs might be uh, limited. We're, we're gonna work with our musical directors in, in some cases until they get into tech week or very close to the play. Sometimes the, the groupings and the rehearsal groups are limited to small groups. So we're gonna be very flexible in, in allowing sixth graders to still participate and, pro and provide them with that opportunity, but making adjustments for them being present at different times. Uh, so we're gonna continue also to look for opportunities for sixth graders to participate in clubs at our building, but then also have potential partnerships with the elementary schools. Quakertown Elementary, and elementary School is about two blocks away, I've been in communication with Dr. Zach and the principal there about, about potential partnerships with fifth and sixth grade clubs after school uh, that may come up of, of interest for students uh, in either building. But then also the, the possibility of sixth grade students uh, serving as peer mentors, peer role models, tutors, uh, best buddies, or other similar relationships with younger students at the elementary level in after school activities. So we'll, we'll be working very hard to flesh out what that will look like, what the opportunities will be, but we're committed to providing uh, as many opportunities as possible in continuing them that exist, but then also exploring and developing new opportunities for sixth grade students uh, with this proposed change. That is excellent. Thank you for explaining that. I, I know these decisions are often difficult to make because what we're trying to do is move um, move our, our start times later, especially for our high school students. And, and in order to accomplish that, this uh, model allows us to have a two and a half tier bus system. So from a budget standpoint, we have to look at all these things. And, and I did get a lot of feedback from folks as far as the sixth grade center was concerned. And it sounds like our administration is gonna do as much as they possibly can to allow those students to continue to participate in the various different clubs and activities and maybe even present options for, for new opportunities. So thank you very much for, for that explanation. Now, I have one Dr. Harner along the same lines about the tech school with the high school kids. Is their tech day gonna be impacted or shortened or um, are, th are they gonna be able to follow the same tech school schedule that the other districts are? We're able, well, I don't know what the other districts, how they do. Um, we've been various, at various times over my last seven years, we had like 25 less minutes than the other districts when I first got here. Um, start times changed and we were able to minimize it. Um, 
the, the greatest impact is not at, uh, if there's, I don't believe there's any impact to answer your question directly. Yeah. The greatest impact by starting later is going to be on athletics because uh, my concern in the beginning of my time here was in the amount of students that would be um, missing the, their last period of the school day and because of it away activities, away start times. We can set our own start uh, game times for our sports activities that happen in the afternoon We sit at when we're home. But we have to obviously follow what our, when we're the visitor, we have to go there. So that's where the biggest impact is at the high school for the number of students and the coaches who are teachers um, won't be available for the last period of the day in some cases and for some games but not at the tech school. Uh, Matt, Matt has worked that out. Matt, are you, Matt is out there. Do you have, would you like to ask him some more specific questions, Chris? Um, no, I mean, that was basically it at the tech school and, and what you had mentioned about sports. Uh, I got a couple questions from tech school parents directly. So that's why I wanted to okay. bring that one up at the public meeting tonight. Thank you, sir. All right, I think that we're ready for a vote on this. So, Actually, I had a question. I'm sorry, Kaylin. I had a question sure. about the um, early childhood program and the uh, the plan to put one in tonight. Would that be a new program or an additional program? Excuse me. Or would that be one of the ones, say, from, from QE or from uh, uh, POF moving over there? Or is this, like I said, is this just a new program or new room? I believe there's already one there. At 90? Yeah, right, Dr. Harner? It, I, I am sorry, I was trying to find more information out <laughs> on your question, Chris. Um, and, uh, I, and, I, and I see that D Dr. Hoffman, who is on vacation today, this week, is joining us. So she has better information. To, uh, so I, um, for, for Chris's question, and then, uh, then I'll get back to Brian, what your question was. I'm still working on the last question. Uh, sure, Alicia, thank you. Would you, you pop in? Thank you. Sure, thanks. Um, so Mr. Spear, Mr. V and I are uh, working with the tech school on the schedule, which is actually why you'll notice that um, the way that this is worded in board docs, it actually does say um, that the, the, sh the time could shift uh, slightly from what's presented based on, on what's needed. And that is directly as a result of making sure that our students get the appropriate time at the tech school. So. Um, we are definitely working on that. We do have the longest travel time of any of the districts, so it does make it a little bit more difficult for us to align exactly, but we will um, be certain to make sure they get the, the two hours that they need there at a minimum. Um, and then in terms of the NIDIG class, it is an existing uh, classroom that we already have with the IU. Thank you. Oh, uh, now I knew, know what the topic is. If you remember back a couple of years ago when we were designing NIDIG, it was built with a pre-K program and a Head Start uh, collaboration with the IU in mind. Yep. <clears throat> right. Any other questions? All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Is there aye. anyone opposed? Aye. Okay, the motion carries unanimously. Moving on to our policy and programs consent agenda. We have the approval of the committee recommendations. There's some um, different numbers listed and explanations for that if you're interested. We also have the approval to apply for a flexible instruction day to the uh, PA Department of Education. So I'll need a motion to vote on those items. So moved. Can I get second. a second please? Mr. Okay. Kern, seconds. Discussion. You better define the um, the thing we're filing with PDE. Your question, sir, is whatever Did the. Did you uh, want to see the document itself? No, but just again, explain what we're filing and why, please. Okay, sir. Um, the uh, several years ago, the the, uh, the State Department came up with a flexible instructional day, and that really didn't, I think maybe five districts out of 500 applied for it. Last year, prior to the governor saying we had this emer emergency ability because of COVID, 
um, it, it, a lot of districts started applying for it for, for COVID. So right now, 384, uh, as of the state, on the state webpage, they're saying about 384 LEAs out of maybe 700 have a five-day um, FID approved. And what I'm trying to do is to make sure we have that in our back pocket in case we have an emergency, want to use it for a snow day or something that comes up. Um, and so the, the state will authorize us to, to, to have that fit in place. Um, what we have to do when we when you approve this tonight and the agenda is approved at the May 13th meeting, then I take that that approval and a letter from the from the board president saying that the board has, has done this. We send off 10 samples of our of our best practices that we have used during COVID for instruction, virtual instruction. And we've already prepared those things. They all go into a file. PDE looks at it. They come back and give us the blessing for the next three years to have five FID days during each school year, up to five. And, and for it's anybody that wants to know what FID is, it's flexible instruction day. <laughs> Most of the people probably haven't looked at the board docs that are okay. listening in here. So, I apologize. Thank you. No, Chris. It's okay. It's just just a way to let the community know we got their back on a lot of different things. Yes, thank you for the explanation. Um, all right, is everybody ready to vote? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, that motion carries unanimously. Uh, before I move on to the information items, we did get quite a few questions about the prom and uh, why we made the decisions. And I, when I say we, I shouldn't say we because it wasn't us, it really was. There was a committee that was formed of students uh, for the senior class, as well as I believe the junior class on how we were going to allow students into our prom. We did get a lot of questions around why we were only allowing students within our own district as well as grade level, I believe, Dr. Harner. Um, so I know that we had planned on at least kind of just explaining to the public why we did that made that decision the way we did. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, Joe, would you please elevate um, Matt? And he can give you the you and the community, the details behind it. Mr. V, where are you? There he is. Putting you on the spot. Sorry about that, sir. Uh, he was expecting it. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite all right. Thank you. Um, so prom, yeah, yes. Yeah. So I believe there were there were two inquiries about that to the board. I did, was able to meet with both students this morning earlier uh, and uh, explain to them that reasoning behind some of the decisions. Uh, for for me, it was quite easy. Um, I, um, I had spoken uh, with uh, the administration about the health and safety plan and the parameters around it. So I charged the prom committee to uh, come up with a plan uh, that uh, fits within the health and safety plan, and uh, they came up with a proposal. Uh, and that proposal was quite easy for me to approve. And the proposal included uh, having students to, uh, uh, only having students of the senior class, uh, which for me, when I considered it was, was, was in line with what other Bucks County schools were doing. Uh, I, I was in contact with the principals of other Bucks County schools uh, or high schools rather. And um, it, was, it was in line with that. Um, and so uh, they had proposed uh, a plan that included uh, seniors only. Uh, they had put out surveys to their peers uh, it seemed to be quite okay with them. And uh, for me, the plan that they proposed to me was uh, was good to approve. I forwarded to the administration. It was approved there as well. Uh, and we moved forward. And so it was a plan completely uh, proposed by uh, the committee. Uh, and we uh, we approved it as, um, as proposed. Thank you very much for that explanation. So, and I just want to make sure I understand. So uh, the state, does the state dictate to us capacities that really influence that decision? Matt? I think he froze. He froze. Oh, that's a bummer. Yeah, 
Yeah, yes, ma'am, it does. To answer your question, does we're following the state with what they're doing. Uh, Rachel Holler, Dr. Holler, for many of you, you know her. She used to be in the district. She facilitated the conversations with all the high school principals so they could maximize what we're doing for proms, what we're doing for graduation and all that. And they're all sharing and and we're in alignment with what like what's going on up in next door with Penn Ridge. Yeah. Matt, are you back with us yet? Or do you have to restart? He's probably restarted. Oh, he's come. Yeah. And we um, acknowledge thanks. that it's difficult for our seniors this year, really all of our students, but this year is hard because this is the prom, you know, you guys feel like you're not getting everything that, that you probably expected. I think that, and for, if it were up to me, I'd say, I think if it was up to the board, we'd probably say, you know, we don't care who you bring, but we also have to be aware and follow certain parameters that are in place for us. Yeah, and looks also like safety. I'll, I'll let him go first. I, I missed part of that conversation, obviously. <laughs> um, so so uh, I will say when it comes to limitations to the venue as uh, dictated by the state, I think that was the last I heard. Uh, the limitations uh, that I know of are not as much dictated by the uh, number limitation or the percentage limitation as much as by the distancing limitation. So if we are working with a six foot limit, uh, six foot distancing uh, between people, uh, for example, with graduation that I looked at, um, uh, it might be 50% capacity, but at six feet, um, I can't get past a 30% capacity. And so the, the, the limitations aren't necessarily the numbers as much as the distancing requirement uh, that it comes with. And so if students need to be at six feet distance on average, uh, that is the limiting factor, uh, not the number. Um, and so uh, when it looks at prom too, I know that the students themselves were very concerned about uh, the possibility of being considered a close contact and therefore or close contact or even being considered positive uh, if they were to have to test as a requirement uh, that they would not be eligible to attend graduation. Uh, that was also one of the reasons why our junior class and I'm very proud of our students there, um, they had decided to postpone their event to the spring uh, because they did not want to be the reason why our seniors could not attend graduation should anything um, occur at their event. So, so the juniors were very responsible in their uh, approach and said that we don't want to take the spotlight away from the seniors uh, and their graduation. And so, so the students themselves uh, did uh, uh, were okay with some of the limitations around prom just so, so that they could make uh, uh, this graduation ceremony happen. Um, and, and so I was, I was happy to approve that. Um, uh, and, and we did approve that without the, without the requirement of testing uh, prior to the event, uh, which could, in essence, be limiting in and of itself should students be, um, um, you know, what do you say, um, uh, uh, you, you know, without symptoms, uh, still positive, uh, you know, non-symptomatic and still positive. So, so the, the testing requirement is, is taken away by, uh, by requiring the masks and still requiring distancing measures at the prom. It's, a, it's definitely a tough one. I am going to say we're going to put the trust in, in you and the administration and our te excuse me and our students who were on this committee to make the best decision. I, I just thought it would be a good idea for us to at least explain that to to the community and, and understand that we put some thought into that. Well, I appreciate it and I, and I think it is in line with what the Bucks County uh, schools are doing. It does sound like it and I know even across state lines, I've seen similar practices take place. I just want to say how disappointed I was for the seniors that don't, you know, get to bring their others from other schools and stuff to their prom. You know, it's one of those highlights of your life or whatever. And I'm sure that though the students made this decision, it wasn't completely unanimous. And there's somebody disappointed they can't bring their uh, significant other to the prom. And I think that's very disappointing. But, but I, I'm, I am very proud that our, our students as a whole came to that decision democratically. I think it was the wise decision and it makes me pretty proud. So just want to say It certainly that. was a uh, lesson in leadership for our students as well. Yes. I agree. All right. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Thank I'm going to move on. Oh, I'm sorry. Did somebody mention something? No? Okay. 
Okay, uh, just as a reminder to board members, there's a statement of financial interest form that would be due tomorrow if you have not already done so. Do we have any new business from board members? Just want to say one thing real quick. I am home now. Today I got my, uh, I don't know if you can see this, the background of uh, the PSBA sends out what they call their state of the state uh, information. Every board member should be receiving this. It has a lot of information about um, just numbers and figures about what's happening in the schools. No preaching, no politicking, just facts. And you can draw your own conclusion about what you want to tell your local state representatives are important things that you feel the school needs or doesn't need and so forth and so on. So keep an eye out for this at everybody's house, please. I got mine today and there's easy to read graphs in it too, which makes it really, really cool, Mr. Kern. <laughs> <laughs> That's why John's excited. Yes. Oh, mine, mine came the other day and I read it twice already. They're always really good. I feel like they're always very informative. So thank you for mentioning that. Any yeah, other new smart. business? This, this is a hilarious graph. Ninety-nine point three 99.3%. Okay, I don't think you need to make a graph for that. So, right, okay. that's so funny. <laughs> it's for the added effect. Okay, uh, dates for board member calendars. We have a committee meeting change uh, for the week of May 3rd, the finance committee meeting Wednesday, May 5th. Uh, that was initially on the 6th as well as a facilities meeting is going to be Wednesday, May 5th. And that was initially on the 6th as well. We're also gonna cancel um, or postpone the policy committee meeting on May 6th and that's due to the meeting that we're gonna be having regarding the comprehensive plan. Board calendar dates. So we have our next meeting is gonna take place May 13th. Hopefully that'll be in person and I'll be able to see all your faces and that'll be wonderful. And uh, there's also some additional committee meeting calendar dates for um, anyone out there in the public who's curious about that. Did we get any additional public comment? This is our second and last chance for a public comment. Uh, yes, we did. We have two comments. Um, and they're both from the same person. They're both from David O'Donnell of Richland Township. Um, the board voted to approve the development of a cyber instruction model for the 21-22 school year. I would like to provide the board with some experience that my fa family has had with the current virtual instruction instructional model and the edu, edu um, it's who's providing this cyber program I'm sorry I don't know ingenuity have a or something yes, yes yes thank you my daughter has been attending all her classes as a virtual student unfortunately due to the departure of the school's German teacher my daughter is now currently completing her German class via ingenuity. The virtual learning that my daughter has received from QSCD teachers is far superior to ingenuity. QCSD teachers are more responsive and QCSD curriculum is more challenging. I felt it was important to bring this to the board's attention and the public's attention. My hope is that as the administration works on developing the new flex cyber instructional model, the administration will be holding ingenuity. Edg Ingenuity. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> to the same high standards that we have come to expect from the school district. Since the, oh my gosh, this word's going to kill me. Since the edu, you know what I mean, flex yep. cyber instructional model will not be following the same curriculum as the QCSD teachers, students will not be able to move between live in person instruction and virtual instruction. What is the plan for continuing the education of students who find themselves in quarantine during the 21-22 school year or if a building needs to close? And I apologize, I cannot say that word. <laughs> no problem. Was that both comments or was that just one of the two? It, they were both comments from Mr. O'Donnell. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for those comments. Oh, who wants to speak? Uh, I was just gonna say that'll be something good to talk about when we bring up 
the, when Dr. Hoffman presents the ideas. Yeah, and, and I mean, I know that there's been, there have been some questions about the upcoming school year and we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what it's gonna look like, but I think we're all hoping for normal. You know, we're, we're hoping for a, an environment where we don't have to mask, where we can hug again and we can do circle time and um, give each other high fives. You know, we, we really just don't know what that's gonna look like, but I think ultimately that is something we're really hopeful for. So that would mean, you know, we wouldn't have quarantining and all these other things. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of time between May and when the next school year begins. So we will cross that bridge when we get there. All right, with that, I will uh, conclude our meeting and ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second, Mr. Second. All right, guys, look, it's 8.59. Quick. Good job, everyone, and thank you all for joining us. Hopefully All we'll favor, be, say uh, aye. Like Good night, all. Yeah. Bye, oh, yeah. night, all. Bye. 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 Wash your hands. Wash your hands. All right, thank you, everyone. Hey, Have a good we... night.